Fly ball down the long run for Reynolds. Cruz goes oh, no. back on it, and he gets in Reynolds' way, and that's going to allow a run to score. What's Cruz doing? That's not his ball. Then he throws it away. What is he doing? And Alvarez stands at third. That should have ended the inning. Instead, another run is in on another Cruz error, and a man's at third base. An incredulous Joe Block. Two errors on one play, three in the game for O'Neill Cruz, who had a dismal series. And joining us now on the fan hotline to get into that and more from the Post Gazette, he is Andrew Destin. Fan hotline presented by Sullivan Super Service, providing trusted plumbing and HVAC service for over 50 years. Andrew, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. And the first question is Do you like being referred to as Destiny's Child? Do you like this? <laughs> Thanks for having me on, guys. How are you both doing this morning? Um, Solid, man. Uh, let's see. So the nickname is funny because Mr. Starkey thinks he came up with it, but it dates back to high school. I had teachers who used to call me that. So, mm. But I've always been a last name guy because there's a million Andrews in the world. So I, I kind of just got used to it. It's Destin, Destiny's Child, whatever it is. Does Derek I've Shelton really call you Destiny's Child? Do, do any of the guys in the clubhouse call you that? Uh, it's just Shelton at this point, but I think well, he's only the one that's old enough <laughs> yeah. that's right. to know Destiny's Child. That's right. De definitely that. I don't, anybody who's my age pretty much doesn't know doesn't know Destiny's Child, but it's uh it's starting to catch on. I think with other members of the coaching staff, so it's all fun games. It's all it's all a good time. Fan morning show is brought to you by Guardian Protection. So we heard the crew's double error right off the shoot there, and mm -hmm. I mean, is it? Is it overstating things to say that this is the most important series of O'Neill Cruz's career? Because I could see this thing going in one of two directions for the young man here, Destiny's Child. Um, I think it would be, you know, a little bit of an overstep just in the sense that we've kind of seen this from O'Neill Cruz. Maybe not this egregious, but this is the experience, right? Where when he's hot, when it's clicking, it's tremendous. And he looks like a top 20 player in baseball. Like he has that potential inside him. The reality is he's just such a mercurial player at this point in his career, and it's worth noting. I'm not trying to use this as an excuse, right? Like last year, didn't play many baseball games due to the season-ending injury, and this is a guy who in general needs to continue getting reps at shortstop, needs to continue getting reps. So, you know, we can see things spiral. Like when he's facing a really good lefty in Framber Valdez, that's just not a good matchup for a guy who in general doesn't hit lefties particularly well. So, you know, maybe at the 10,000-foot level, it looks like things are spiraling, but it, I, don't, I wouldn't read into this too, too much. It's a bad series, but we've seen him have equally as many great series this year. He's just not a consistent player. That's just who he is at this stage in his career. Remains to be seen how it develops, but I wouldn't place too, too much stock in this other than a bad series. You hope for his sake and for the Pirates' sake that they can just move on from it. Andrew, do you anticipate us seeing uh, Kiner Falefa tonight? Uh, does he is he ready is he you know off the 10 day I guess, well actually it was longer than that is he is he up to par of playing and on the the track of playing tonight yeah I would say so I mean just based off of everything we've heard and I know you know Noah can speak to this more from being in Houston with the team while he was there but I would you know I would expect that this would be an opportunity for him to come off and if it's not today it's probably sometime relatively soon I mean he was traveling you know met up with the team in Houston versus you know, reporting straight to Indianapolis or something like that to start up a, you know, continue a rehab assignment or anything like that. So I view it as he's very close. Um, if it's not today, it's probably at some point during this series with goes without saying definitely the homestand. And I would imagine he will be the starting second baseman for as long as Nick Gonzalez is out. When Nick Gonzalez comes back, given how poorly Key Brian Hayes has hit, could you see him being the full-time third baseman? Um, I think it's a possibility. I don't think that, you know, I'll, I'll phrase it this way. I fully well see him dipping into Cabrian Hayes' playing time. I think that happens. But I think what we see with Kiner Falefa is this is a guy who's going to bounce around the field. Like, he's probably going to take a few starts a week from Michael A. Taylor in center, probably going to take a few from Cabrian Hayes. Maybe you spell Nick Gonzalez, because for a while there, Gonzalez was really playing six days a week, things of that nature. It allows you to actually give O'Neill Cruz an off day when they're facing a lefty like a Framber Valdez, where it's not a great matchup for Cruz, and it allows him to actually rest a little bit more, which is probably important given that the ankle, yeah, right now it's in a good spot, but like he's still playing a lot of games relative to last season. This move can't hurt. Like I really do like this move, 
not just from what it means for the Pirates um, in terms of what he provides individually, but how it impacts the rest of the roster. But to your question, Adam, yeah, I think that he's going to dip into Brian Hayes' playing time, but I would be pretty surprised if he supplanted him as a full-time starter anytime soon. Maybe if Hayes really continues to go down a, um, you know, the rabbit hole there and continues to struggle at the plate, we have a different conversation. But for the time being, this is a guy who's going to bounce around the field and give people days off while staying in the lineup on a pretty consistent basis. I thought one of the most legitimate trade pieces was going to be a Roldis Chapman. Were you surprised that they held on to a Roldis Chapman and didn't trade him for something else? No, just based on conversations I'd had with people throughout the league, I had a hunch this wasn't going to happen. Um, the general consensus that I got from people was that if the Pirates were under 500, like let's throw out a number, if they were five games under 500, then they would have probably considered trading a Roldis Chapman. But the reality is that as much as he is an expensive piece and on an expiring contract and things of that nature, he helps the 2024 team. That's why he's here. So if you're trying to get to the postseason, like you kind of need Aroldis Chapman, and especially when you compound that with David Bednar hasn't had a tremendous season and Colin Holderman has been great all year, but not recently. I think there's some skepticism to the idea of, oh, well, you can move away from Aroldis Chapman because you've got all these bullpen arms, especially at the back end. This bullpen, you know, I'm kind of getting this off the top of my head, but I think the bullpen this year is either 24th or 25th in MLB and ERA this year. So subtracting arguably your most valuable or one of your most valuable arms felt like that would just put the team in a worse spot versus moving Martin Perez, you know, that's shipping in excess. So I, I never seriously thought Aroldis Chapman was going to be dealt, though I did completely understand why, uh, you know, that idea warranted uh Warrants it serious consideration because it makes a lot of sense. It just doesn't if you're trying to make the postseason. Andrew Destin joining us from the Post Gazette covers the Buccos for that outlet. Of the three major league moves that they made, the three pieces they added, how impactful are those three trades? Is this, when you look at the team on paper, a postseason caliber roster in your mind? Okay, so the first move that I would say that I really like the most impactful of them it's got it. I would say that kind of Falefa, but Brian De La Cruz isn't far behind. Like, obviously these guys are going to help an offense that is on the whole struggle this year. It's just a matter of which guy is going to be better. Um, kind of Falefa, there's certainly some concerns there because it's a guy who's in the midst of a career year. He's never hit this well. He's never gone on base this frequently. So there is a little bit of concern of, is there some regression in store? And is that going to basically, you know, coincide with his time in Pittsburgh? That's definitely a legitimate concern. De La Cruz, um, you know, a less impactful player this year, but a, on the whole, very consistent one throughout his four MLB seasons. You can look at the OPS. It's been relatively constant. This is a guy who pretty much every year you know what you're getting, and this year he's provided more power than usual, so that certainly can't hurt. Um, but when you look at the roster, you know, with getting Jalen Beeks, who, you know, a nice left-hand relief option probably earlier in games than, you know, the sixth or the seventh inning, something like that. I look at the roster. I would phrase it this way. They kept pace with the other teams that are in contention for wild card spots, but they did not exceed them. They did not put the roster in a spot that it's, you know, infinitely better than the Cardinals or the Braves or the Padres. Like, I would still say those three teams are at the very least equal or better than the Pirates. However, what they did do is they held serve. They kept pace with them. They're very much a team that should be taken seriously. Without those kinds of moves, I would have really struggled to say, okay, they're right on, you know, right on pace with those three teams that frankly right now would be my three picks to be wild card teams. You also have to throw a team like the Mets in there that did get better at this deadline. So they did enough. I don't think they made it this clean and obvious they are going to be a postseason team, though. I think that's a little bit much to say. Any update or a new timeline on Jared Jones? Nothing new. I mean, I'm pretty steadfast with the mid-August. That's kind of been the timeline that I've thrown out there, but maybe a little bit earlier um, for his sake. It would be great if he could pitch during the road trip when they're in LA and San Diego, just cause he's from there. Um, I know that would mean a lot to, to him and to the family and all those sorts of things, but it might be something where we see him make a rehab, a start, you know, a rehab start in Indianapolis. Cause he's already thrown a few bullpens. He's probably close to that SIM game next would be a rehab start. So I would say you could probably reasonably suspect 10 days away. So maybe that coincides with an arrival around that, August 12th, August 14th timeline. Um, that's kind of what we've been predicting for a little bit there. So he's very close. He's getting there. Andrew Destin, Post-Gazette. We appreciate your time, man. Thanks for waking up with us. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me on, guys. See you, buddy. See you.